Um, so how do you get going? Well, uh, we've got our... I'll have some URLs up on the slides at the end where you can uh, get hold of our uh, stuff. But um, we have uh, packages available and uh, once you get started, you can uh, pretty easily drop in 2D content and 3D content side by side as you saw me doing. Um, so maybe some thoughts might be that you could replace an image or an icon that you have, maybe a button, because you can just put a mouse area on top. Um, and you could have a 3D effect so that that uh, thing revolves or disappears off the screen when that button's no longer available. Things like repeaters and models, uh, those now work with uh, Qt3D. We did some work in our last release to make that happen so that you can have cubes and uh, structures or models appearing and disappearing as part of your uh, QML data models. And uh, mostly it just works. Um, sometimes if you want to have a uh, sort of a, you know, like a, a page where you have a set of properties on something, you could put that on the back side of a cube and then it hides away, the cube disappears back and just becomes a flat four pane again. So, you know, it, it can be used as a nice sort of instinctive uh, sort of idiom. I'm not a user interface person. I'm really looking forward to seeing, you know, people that have got a lot of talent uh, with U UI design and, and that sort of work, uh, seeing what, what people can come up with. Um, I've, I've tried to sell this idea that you can iterate quickly and experiment, as you saw me doing, until you get the right effect. But um, there is a lot of science underneath uh, OpenGL. And those of you that have put in the hard yards to, to learn how transformations and projections work, um, you know, that's really valuable knowledge and that's not going go, to go to waste if you're using Quick 3D. We, we do expose uh, things like our camera. And, and while you can achieve a lot of stuff without knowing any OpenGL at all, uh, just by experimenting and trying setting a few different values, uh, we do also provide access to things like the, uh, you know, uh, ambient and specular colours and, and and so forth. You can position the camera where you want. You can animate it, change the size of the lens, and so forth. So that stuff is available. And if that's not enough, uh, of course, you can still go back to our C++ API, write a nice little uh, QML plugin, and that then gives you access to all of the stuff that's available through our C++ API. Okay, so I'm just going to see if I can show some stuff that I have in our latest release. Can I get a uh, phone running here? Hopefully. With the luck I've been having today. All right, now that's to be expected. It's on its side. So you just I want to see everybody just tilt there. No, you don't have to do that. Okay, because these uh, will hopefully... So, uh, that's a uh, skybox. There's not actually 20,000 billion triangles out there. Um, I've made the images in the skybox just a little bit uh, off kilter, so you can see a stretching effect there. But this uh, skybox functionality is achieved by just having six images arranged on the inside of a box and you do a little trick where you put a camera right in the center of that box and the, uh, what I've done there is I've used QML to just animate the uh, camera uh, so the cube is not moving, the camera is actually revolving slowly around the cube and as it does so you get this nice impression of a, uh, of a 3D world. Um, in this case, I created those images using a program called Terragen, which really does have billions of triangles and takes ages and ages to render. But using a skybox as a trick, that allows you to bake that render into a nice texture that you can then uh, use as a, uh, a backdrop for one of your applications, and it's pretty cheap. Okay, I'll just swipe that away. There we go. Okay, uh, something else. So, uh, I don't want to say that uh, Qt Quick 3D is a fantastic game development platform, but obviously 3D, one of the first things you think of is games. 
One of my guys in my team wrote this little app. Yay! And I hardly used... There's my fuel bar on the left-hand side there, and I got uh, 88 points by landing my little 3D model of the uh, lunar lander there on the top of the crater. And what I, I, what I did to create the models for this, um, my colleague Julian wrote the uh, actual JavaScript game functionality in the QML, but I, I created those models using Blender, which is a free uh, application for creating 3D stuff. I made my little lunar lander model, and then I um, uh, did the landscape uh, as a separate model. And that, that act came together in a day, basically. In fact, the, the guts of it was really done in uh, just an hour or two. Uh, the uh, flames are done using a, a, by scaling a, a quad with a texture on it, an animated um, texture. I'll just run that again so you can see that. But we get a nice little sort of cheating effect there. And, you know, when you're writing uh, applications like games, uh, you can cheat your ass off. Right? That's what you want to do. If it looks good, then it is good. You, you're not trying to simulate reality. So these flames are really just that scaled quad with a texture on it. And, it, you know, it's fine, especially on a small screen device like this phone. So uh, here on this screen, I've got a number of uh, applications. The ones that are in green are using our C++ API. Uh, the ones in blue are uh, using QML. And all of these are available with our Harmattan package. Um, I have a little bit of bad news in that the packages currently run on these developer devices uh, that I have, but uh, you're going to have to give us a couple more days to get some new versions. Uh, I'll put the FTP site up on the last thing so you can download these Harmattan packages uh, for your N9 probably in about a week. We didn't quite get access to them before we left, which was a bit annoying. Uh, I'm just going to demo one last thing here. Um, uh, this application is uh, using shaders to um, basically interpolate between the uh, texture coordinates of, a, of the actual uh, quad itself and the... Um, Bezier patches that comprise that uh, teapot. So uh, the shader code is embedded directly as text in a QML file. Those of you who have been to other presentations here might know that very recently the QML guys added inline shaders into their stuff. Guess where that came from? Stolen from us. <laughs> but anyway, if you have that, that experience of using those inline shaders, it's pretty much the exact same mechanism. You can create a property, uh, and then that appears immediately as a uniform in your shader code. So what we've done there is that interpolation factor is just being animated uh, on a slow sort of basis there on that inline shader. So if I click over to this one, we've just done a little uh, rotate there. And you can probably recognize that bounce is uh, just the classic QML uh, in-out bounce. All of the uh, source code for those shaders and that QML is available uh, as part of our package. Okay, so we'll flip back here. Okay, so what I need to do now is to see if I can get our uh, William app here onto our device. The pressure's on me now as William's hired consultant. I have to produce the goods. We don't want to miss the window of getting onto the Nokia store, so let's see if I can do it. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take our stock standard uh, text-only application that I've got here, and I'm going to create a new file or project that is a C++ wrapper around that uh, QML. So I'm going to ask for a cute quick application, which includes a C++. Choose that. And I'll call this one William N9. And I'm going to tell it to use an existing QML file, which will be 
our driver file here from our, our main application. Now we're ready to go and uh, hopefully uh, the SDK will create all of the um, necessaries for us. I'm going to try to uh, proof it on the desktop first. So I'm going to ask the uh, SDK to create a, a desktop uh, C++ wrapper for it as well. Now I wonder if I'm going to get bitten by the same problem. Uh, I'll try both these targets and see what it does. I'll make that one a release. Okay. Now I'm going to uh, <clears throat> change it to our uh, icon that we got before. Let's see if I can just find it here. Our 80 by our 80 icon. Oh, gods of live demos, be with me. Please. Okay, all right, so it's created a bunch of stuff. It all looks good. I'm sure I need all of that stuff, whatever the hell it is. I'm Australian, so you're going to have to forgive my colloquialisms a little bit, hopefully. Yeah. All right, so um, what it's done for us is created a whole bunch of C++. Uh, hopefully we don't have to care too much about that right now. But uh, we've got two targets. We've got our... Um, desktop one and then our embedded one. The first thing I'm going to do is to hope that we actually get a, a build here with our desktop. Uh, now, uh, let's see. We may run into this issue again, but uh, hey. All right, so that much works. <clears throat> now we're going to flip over and try our uh, embedded target. So uh, what's going to happen now is we're running our... Um, MADI toolchain, cross-compiling it for ARM. Uh, so we ha hopefully have an ARM binary there ready to go. And now what we want to do is um, I'm going to try and deploy it to our device here. As you know, we've already got our cute uh, 3D libraries on here ready to go, installed from our package. Uh, to get to this point, what I had to do is actually set up my N9 here using uh, the device configurations menu. And I deployed a public key and uh, went through a wizard to set all that stuff up. On the device, what I also had to do was actually set up a thing called the uh, SDK by uh, going into settings. And uh, here's my little SDK connector here. That uh, can connect by USB or WLAN and uh, that should give us the ability to deploy our apps onto our device. So that's what I had to do to get to this point. Now let's see if I'm going to get a positive test here. Yep, looks like it can speak to the device. So now I should be able to hopefully deploy uh, William's app. So it's doing a bunch of mystical Debian stuff. It's connecting to the device. I can hardly bear to look. It's created a .deb file. And uh, the Aegis uh, security system is now installing it on there. We're processing some triggers to get our icon in place. Please. Yes, all right. Now, with any sort of luck, if I can just get you to flick back to the phone. And you can see right down the bottom there, we have our William N9 application. 
And you can't fake a William, right? There's only one. <laughs> Don't try that at home, kids. <laughs> All right, so uh, that is pretty much all I have. Uh, I'll take questions. Uh, you can send me emails if you like. Our documentation is sitting there online. Uh, that's the FTP site to download the Harmattan packages, but not just yet. Give us another few days to get those up there. There's our IRC channel, and there's our mailing list. OK. This gentleman in front, just wait for the microphone. And we'll... Can you render 2D QML to a texture? So we've had a number of requests for exactly that functionality. Uh, we have a roadmapped item which we're calling uh, FBO support. And by that, what we mean is all of the kinds of things that you generally want to do uh, with having an alternate render, render path so that you can render 2D QML, uh, which is uh, available in, uh, by default in SceneGraph, uh, but a co community member has submitted a, um, a patch that allows you to do it in uh, 4.x as well. Uh, so, and it'll also allow you to do things like uh, reflections. So you could render an object uh, and then flip it upside down and then render it as a reflection in some water and stuff. So it's not available yet, but uh, it should be ready by, uh, will definitely be done by our uh, release date, which is going to be uh, early next year. But if you want to log on to our bug tracker, uh, which is the standard Qt bug tracker on Qt 3D, you can vote up the FBO support item, which is currently uh, fourth on our roadmap, and uh, hopefully we'll get that done for you as soon as we can. Hello again. Uh, is there any plan to to develop an importer of different animations made in 3ds Max, for instance? Can you support a direct uh, import of animations? Right, right. That's an interesting question. Um, do you have a specific use case in mind? We are we're working in the car industry, and we are making some uh, uh, how do you call that uh, board uh, with. Um, Speeder, uh, speed uh, meters and stuff, oh, right. and yep. we want uh, our designers are making uh, animations, uh, complicated animations directly mm. in 3ds Max, yep. uh, combining different rotations and on different axes at the same time. Yep. And it's quite difficult to reproduce them uh, writing uh, directly in QML. Yes. So, yes. Um, mm. Okay. No. Uh, I did mention briefly uh, skeletal animation and uh, that code is sitting in our Garrett repository right now. Um, so that uses, uh, I believe, 3D Studio Max's uh, animation format. At the moment, our model importer code uh, uses a third-party project called Asset Importer. So we can read all of those formats, but at the moment, we don't do anything much with the animation information that's embedded in that. Uh, the skeletal animation implementation uh, does use blending of um, animations. What William's talking about is the situation where if you have a figure that's sort of walking, so you have a walk animation that's uh, moving these various joints, you then have a waving animation, and you may want to just blend the two of them, stop and start them. Uh, so the challenges for us are to create a nice QML syntax for that. Uh, and also, you know, ideally you want to be able to say walk.run or walk.stop so you get this very nice uh, way where you can just load up the model, it'll extract out the um, uh, information about the animations that are embedded in there and expose them so that you can just start and stop them using QML. So uh, we do have plans for that. Uh, at the moment it's not supported, but we are uh, very much aware of the need for it. Um, We'll have to do it uh, for skeletal animation, and uh, it should uh, play out for other types of animation. 
Uh, obviously, at the moment, we have sort of standard rigid body style animation. Uh, we've had requests for sort of the inverse kinematic style robotics uh, sort of uh, animations, and also other people are talking to us about um, uh, physics models uh, integration. I think we're likely to do that as a plug-in because those things can get quite big and they require a, a platform with a bit more grunt. But um, the thing that you're asking about is is uh, definitely on our on our sites, um, and we will definitely have animation blending as part of skeletal animation, uh, and we may try to depending on how expensive it is to expose the same kind of logic for uh, other animation formats. But uh, we're also open, of course. Our, uh, our uh, contribution model is the same as, as Qt's. So if you guys uh, ha have a project in mind, we'd love to even just see the sorts of thoughts that you have about it. They might help us uh, shape our uh, a development and also maybe any contributions that you might have would be great too. Okay. Uh, this gentleman here. I'm wondering, does this work with um, Quick 2? And if so, how uh, how does it work with the scene graph uh, backend? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we've been working really hard to get our stuff working on top of uh, Qt 5 and Qt Quick 2. Uh, at the moment, uh, we're kind of sitting on top of the uh, 2D scene graph. So we have our 3D scene graph doing 3D stuff, and then the 2D one is busy optimizing uh, 2D underneath. Uh, we've got two separate models for our rendering path. One is something we call GL under, and in that case where you have a QML 3D app that occupies all of the screen, it triggers a GL under rendering path, and we take over the whole screen, and we, as soon as we've got hold of a GL context, we dump all our stuff on top of it. You can then put uh, 2D QML buttons on top, if you like, but uh, we're assuming in that rendering path that you, we've got hold of the whole context. So we get a nice quick uh, render and uh, pretty efficient, uh, speedy um, execution uh, in that case. Uh, for the other case where you're composing small amounts of 3D into a 2D app, uh, that happens inside an FBO using the painted item. And obviously there, there is a performance impact with the indirect render. However, because it's typically smaller, you're occupying only a portion of the user interface, uh, it's not quite so important for the performance impact there. And because your eye can't visually detect a lot of fancy detail in the little area. It, it doesn't matter quite so much. We're finding that those two things together have worked quite well for all our example apps, uh, but we still have some work to do to try to make a really tight integration uh, with the 2D scene graph and try to use a lot of the stuff that they've already built. For example, on certain uh, device platforms, it may be the case that um, optimizations that uh, the 2D scene graph has for textures, for example, uh, available to us if we use their textures. So we'll probably uh, try to reduce the duplication and, and take advantage of that as well. So it's, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. The, this gentleman here with this hand up. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, speaking of games, so do you plan to have a 3D positional audio or is it strictly tied to graphics? That's my question. I'm in this project. Okay, so uh, my colleague in Brisbane, uh, Michael Goddard, uh, his team is uh, working on audio. A gentleman at the back there, Jonas Rubber, is uh, in Michael's team, and those guys are uh, busy uh, challenging themselves uh, with 3D audio right now, I believe. And I think they have an early implementation of it that's exposed via QML. So I'd be pretty excited to see uh, someone take advantage of of those two things and put cute 3D objects with, you know, maybe a, you know an animated character that could walk from one side of the screen to the other and have uh, the the audio move from one place to another. But yeah, that's that's exactly the sort of thing. All of that QML stuff that's all coming and bubbling up, uh, it all works together in the same same application. So yeah, great question. Thank you. 
this, this gentleman here? Actually, I think there was a question in the front. Did... No? All right. Um, uh, a question about uh, how deep is um, my, my influence on the, on the rendering. Um, what, what, first, what, what kind of shaders do you support? Do you support switching of um, render states and all that stuff? And um, can I influence like um, sorting, which is uh, important for transparency and that stuff? Can I influence the render pipeline? Uh, okay, so what we do at the moment is um, we have a, a render optimizer in our 3D uh, scene graph. Uh, it was written by me, so it's not fantastic. <laughs> it uh, Basically what it tries to do is uh, sorts by effects first, so that includes shaders. So if you have, say, two or three different shaders in your application, uh, it will try to reduce the number of swaps. So it'll only run each, it'll, it'll do all of the content that uses one shader, then all of the content that uses that in the next one. Within that, uh, it's then sorted by uh, materials and um, uh, below that, uh, I think we, at the moment we assume everything's all in the one VBO as well. Um, we do, when you use our standard stuff, uh, it automatically goes into VBOs and gets uploaded. So at the moment we're assuming you don't have really big scenes with multiple VBOs. Uh, the render optimizer that, that I wrote is um, basically assumes that you've got this sort of declarative type setup where you, you create a 3D scene using QML in the declarative sort of way that I, I described. And then uh, each frame, it's, it's going to make a pass through trying to optimize it. I wrote that uh, with the intention that it could be uh, extended. So uh, there's a, a render state class which you can subclass to return a different uh, ordering result. But the only problem there is you'd have to go back to C++ in order to do that. Um, so the facility is there. It's something we've thought about. And it's, it's a really good question because different applications are quite sensitive uh, to exactly that problem. So we've tried to do the thing that works the best for simple apps. But as soon as you get onto the desktop, it is easy enough to trigger some quite degenerate situations where you get... Uh, poor rendering because of the, the sorts of assumptions that are baked into that um, that render optimizer. Thanks very much. Thanks. Another question in the front here. Yes. What about performance? If you have like more than one cylinder in your app. Okay. So w we have a uh, very simple. Um, uh, view frustum culling um, optimization uh, set up in the scene graph. So if you have a, an application where, for example, your camera is panning through a scene with a number of objects, uh, it will cull the objects that are not visible in front of the camera. Uh, we don't try to do any sort of portal or occlusion culling or anything fancy like that. But for a lot of the apps that you can put onto a phone, it's it, that does save you quite a lot already. Uh, the other thing we do is that uh, geometry is uh, shared by default. So if you create, uh, in the example that I showed on the screen before, we had the, the multiple tin cans with the labels on them. In that case, all the labels were uh, the same. But if you had the same geometry, it's very easy um, to get lots and lots of triangles just by increasing the level of detail on a sphere, for example. But if you had 20 spheres on the screen or 20 spheres in your scene, it would only ever use one copy of that, that geometry. Uh, and we upload that VBO once and then our scene graph refers to it uh, in multiple locations. And you can then hang off a different effect, a different shader, a different texture. So you could have, you know, one shader, you know, exploding triangles, another one painting them or rippling them with a sine wave or whatever you wanted to do. And even though you might have, say, 10,000 triangles in a really smooth sphere, uh, it would only have one copy of that geometry on the uh, GPU. Does, does that answer your question? Maybe I fenced around it a bit. Kind of. 
Okay, great. <clears throat> Anything more? Okay, I think we're done.